Do you think it's possible to eradicate racism from the judicial system? I do. I think as uh, I think that race insinuates itself in all aspects of our lives, and the, judici ju the judicial system is not immune from that. So, to the extent we begin to eradicate uh, dangerous and deleterious race thinking from society generally, then it will uh, be er eradicated from the. Uh, criminal justice system. I think we've got a lot of work to do, and I think it'll be a while. But uh, but I think it's it's doable. I mean, you know, uh, the country. So historians will look back three hundred years from now and take note of the incredible journey of uh, diasporic Africans in the in in, in the U.S. An incredible j journey from. Uh, you know, slavery uh, to the the heights of politics and business and the judiciary and the academy and so forth in not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And actually not a lot of time. And if we can have that sort of movement historically, uh, let's think about what the next 175 years will look like. So I'm not saying it's going to be short, uh, but I'm saying that if we keep at it, uh, keep getting to know each other uh, a little better, uh, keep enforcing laws uh, that prohibit uh, the, the sort of race-based discrimination that people have experienced and provide uh, as a society opportunities uh, for people to thrive in this world, then I think we can, we can see a better world. And if we see a better world, we'll see a better judicial system. So I think it's kind of fascinating if you look throughout history and race is just part of that is uh, we create the other and uh, treat the other with disdain through the legal system, but just through human nature. I tend to believe, we mentioned offline that I work with uh, robots. It sounds absurd to say, especially to you, especially because we're talking about racism and it's so prevalent today. I do believe that there will be almost like a civil rights movement for robots. Because uh, with the, I think there's a huge value to society of having artificial intelligence systems uh, that are, uh, that interact with humans and are, and are human-like. Mm -hmm. And the more they become human-like, you will. They will start. They, they will start to ask very fundamentally human questions about freedom, about suffering, about justice. And there will will have to come face to face, like look in the mirror, in asking the question: Just because we're biologically based, just because we're sort of, uh, well, just because we're human does that mean we're the only ones that deserve the rights? Again, giving, forming another other group, which is robots. And I'm sure there could be along that path, different versions of other that we form. So racism, race is certainly a big other that we've made, uh, as you said, a lot of progress on throughout the history of this country but it does feel like we always create, as we make progress, create new other groups. And of course, the other the other group that uh, perhaps is outside the legal system that people talk about is the essential, now I eat a lot of meat, but the torture of animals, you know, the people talk about when we look back from, you know, a couple of centuries from now, look back at the kind of things we're doing to animals, we might regret that. We might see that in a very different light. And it's kind of interesting to see the future trajectory of what we wake up to about the injustice in our in our ways. Um, but the robot one is the one I'm especially focused on because, uh, but at this moment in time, it seems ridiculous. But I'm sure most civil rights movements throughout history seem ridiculous at first. Well, it's interesting, uh, sort of out, outside of my uh, intellectual uh, bailiwick uh, robots, as, as I understand the development of um, artificial intelligence, uh, though, the um, the aspect that uh, still is missing is this notion of, of consciousness uh, and that it's it's consciousness that is the the thing that uh, will 
uh, will move um, if it were to exist. And I'm not saying that it can or will, but if it were to exist, would move robots from uh, machines to uh, something different, uh, that ex- something that experienced the world in a way analogous to what how we experience it. Um, and also, as I understand the science, there's a, um, unlike what you see on, on television that we're not, we're not, uh, there yet in mm-hmm. terms of, uh, this notion of, uh, the machines having, uh, a consciousness, um, uh, and, or, a, or a, a great general intelligence, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. A huge amount of progress has been made and, there, it's it's fascinating to watch. So I'm, I'm I'm on both minds as a person who's building them. I'm realizing how sort of quote unquote dumb they are, <laughs> but also looking at human history and how poor we are predicting the progress of innovation and technology. It's obvious that we have to be humble by our ability to predict, coupled with the fact that we keep. Uh, to, to use terminology carefully here, we keep discriminating against the intelligence of uh, artificial systems. The smarter they get, the more ways we find to dismiss the, their intelligence. Uh, so this this has just been going on throughout. Where I, <laughs> it's almost as if we're threatened in the most primitive human way, mm-hmm. uh, animalistic way. We're threatened by the power of other creatures, and we want to lessen, dismiss them. So consciousness is a really important one, but the one I think about a lot in terms of consciousness, the very engineering question is whether the display of consciousness is the same as the possession of consciousness. So if a robot tells you they are conscious, if a robot looks like they're suffering when you torture them, if a robot is afraid of death and says they're afraid of death and are legitimately afraid, like for in terms of just uh, everything we as humans use to determine the ability of somebody to be their own entity, they're the one that loves, one that fears, mm-hmm. one that hopes, one that can suffer. If if a robot, like in the dumbest of ways, is able to display that, we it it change it starts changing things very quickly. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it does seem that there's a huge component to consciousness that is a social creation. Mm-hmm. Like we together create our mm-hmm. consciousness. Like we believe our common humanity together. Alone, we wouldn't be aware of our humanity. And the law, as it protects our freedoms, seems to be a construct of the social construct. And when you add other creatures into it, it's not obvious to me that like you have to build, there'll be a moment when you say, this thing is now conscious. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of fake it until you make it. And there'll be a very gray area between fake and make mm-hmm. that uh, is going to force us to contend with, with what it means to be an entity that deserves rights. Mm-hmm. Where all, all men are created equal, the the men part might have to expand in ways that we mm-hmm. are not yet anticipating. And it's very interesting. I mean, my favorite, the fundamental thing I love about artificial intelligence is it gets smarter and smarter. It challenges to think of uh, what is right, the questions of justice, questions of freedom, it basically challenges us to uh, to understand our own mind, to understand uh, what, uh, like, almost from an engineering first principles perspective, to understand what it is that makes us human, that is at the core of all the rights that we talk about and all the documents we write. Mm-hmm. So even if we don't give rights to artificial intelligence systems, we may be able to construct f- more fair, legal systems to protect us humans. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, interesting ontological question uh, between the, the performance of consciousness and, and, and actual consciousness to the extent that it's um, that actual consciousness is anything beyond some contingent reality. 
uh, but you've posed a number of, of of interesting philosophical questions, and then there's also it strikes me that uh, that um, philosophers of religion would pose another set of questions uh, as well when you um, deal with uh, uh, issues of uh, of structure versus soul, body versus soul, and and uh, it it would be a it, it will be a complicated mix, and I suspect I'll be. Uh, dust by the time those questions get get worked out, and uh, so yeah, the soul the soul is a fun one. There's no soul. I'm I'm not sure. Maybe you can correct me, but there's very few discussion of soul in our legal system, right? Right. Correct. So None. so, so uh, None. but there is a discussion about what constitutes a, a human being, and I mean, you gestured at the notion of uh, the potential of the law uh, widening. The domain of uh, so uh, of, of human being. So in 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 that sense, right? Uh, you know, people are very angry because they can't uh, uh, get uh, sort of pain and suffering damages if someone negligently kills a pet because a pet is not a, a human uh, being. And people say, "Well, I love my yeah. pet," but the law sees uh, a pet as chattel, as property, like this yeah. this water bottle. Uh, so the the current legal definitions um, trade on a definition of humanity that may not be worked out in any sophisticated way, but certainly um, there's a there's a shared broad and shared understanding of what what it what it means. Uh, so probably doesn't uh, explicitly contain a definition of something like soul, uh, but it's it's more robust than. You know, a carbon-based organism. Uh, that there's something uh, a, a little more distinct about what the law thinks a human being is. 